Good afternoon. I'm Mark Allen with Gaper.io, and I'm here today with Gordon Wilson, the CEO of Rain Neuromorphics. That's a mouthful to say. Good afternoon, Gordon. Good afternoon, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, Mark. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you could join us today. So to start with, can you just share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Absolutely. Um, so I'm 28 years old. Um, I'm the, currently the CEO of Rain Neuromorphics, and I've been working as a CEO for three years since we were founded in the summer of 20, uh, 2017. Um, before that, I had a short career in political campaigns. Um, and kind of in between the campaigns and this current work, I studied mathematics at the University of Florida. Um, so I've, I'm definitely not the person you expect to be uh, building a semiconductor startup in Silicon Valley. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of fun doing it and, you know, feel really lucky to have an incredible team uh, that I get to lead out here uh, doing some really ambitious work for artificial intelligence. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. So what has been your experience with remote employment? And I'm talking about before the current situation and, sure. you know, and both as an employee and an employer. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I was, so campaign work, when I was working there, we had to be largely in person um, with the exception. So we had, we would do canvassing where we would knock on doors that had to be in person, but we would also do phone banking where we would kind of organize phone calls that could be done remotely. Um, but, but I'll be frank, I really didn't have a, well, a huge amount of remote work experience, but it's funny, as I said that I realized there's one major caveat. So before, as I was, um, in high school and first in college, I did a huge amount of tutoring. Um, I was like an SAT tutor, an SAT, ACT tutor, tutored on a bunch of different kind of high school level subjects. And I did actually a good amount of this tutoring over, um, Skype, uh, and over, uh, digital platforms. And I think that was the first time I realized, you know, that I could, you know, make a, a you know, a good amount of money for myself at the time um, doing something that was completely digital. Um, but that was probably the, the biggest experience of remote work that I had before now. Interesting. So what, what do you think you'd be done uh, different to make, you know, remote work more effective? What would I have done to make that remote, remote work more effective? Any remote or, work or this more now? Yeah, I mean, I would like um, a, in more features in our video communication platforms. You know, I think Zoom is definitely the, the leader with respect to features and having things like breakout rooms. Um, but already I, there are frustrating things like in Zoom, you have only one chat and you can't create sub chats and track separate chats with other people. Um, you know, there are so many, I think, edges for improvement, edges for growth uh, in remote employment. Um, you know, we have been transitioning to remote employment uh, with my team over the last two and a half months. And, um, you know, just identifying and having, ensuring that everyone has the same expectations and ensuring that we have the best digital tools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because, you know, one challenge I think we also face is, you know, it's, it's far easier to just have an informal style of management and kind of task tracking when you see someone every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you don't, you know, you have to be a bit more proactive uh, to ensure that everyone's meeting their, their goals. Yeah. So what do you, on that note, what do you think is the future of remote employment now that you had a taste of it for a while? <laughs> well, I think it's here to stay. You know, I think that, you know, whether, you know, even though I believe we'll, we'll, ultimately get to a vaccine for coronavirus and we won't have to take the extreme precautions that we're taking now, um, you know, remote employment, I think that this will be a lesson for all of us to recognize that, you know, we can reach similar levels of productivity that we had before without needing everyone to be in the same place at the same time. I think we will go towards more flexibility and more and, and greater accommodation for people with, um, you know, with families and with disabilities and with other types of requirements, you know, I think that that will be a better world, you know, because it's one where people hopefully, you know, can integrate life and work in a way that is not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are some really interesting, I think, caveats that we've realized, that, like, for some people, when you work at home, it's very hard to disconnect between uh, from work and to get back into a kind of a home family relaxation state. So in a world where we have more remote work, which I think is the world we're, we're moving into, I would hope that we have tools that allow us to um, create a clear separation 
mm-hmm. between work time and home time. Um, I think that's one, that's a big challenge that will have to be solved um, in order to make it a, a effective and, and healthy for people. Yeah, and it actually might affect the way we build houses in the future. That, yeah. Right? I could see that happen. I mean, not immediately, but I think that's, that trend is coming. So what is the story behind Rain Neuromorphics? Uh, what do you, what's your product? Who do you sell to? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so happy to give you the story. Um, so at Rain Neuromorphics, we build uh, processors, microchips for artificial intelligence that are fundamentally inspired by the brain. Um, and these are used to run these things called artificial neural networks. So artificial neural networks are, you know, I think most people today that are tech adjacent uh, have at least heard of these. Um, they are what have enabled computer vision, uh, natural language processing, um, and a whole host of many, many applications. I mean, the, the markets for applications for neural networks are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and over the last eight years, we've seen this breakneck speed of progress, of improvement of these neural networks. Um, but one of the key you know, limiting factors uh, that, allow, that prevents us from deploying these neural networks at scale is the cost of the hardware that we run them on. Mm-hmm. So yeah, today, people use GPUs, graphics processing units, from, mostly from NVIDIA, as the primary hardware to run these neural networks. The big issue there is it's, this is digital hardware that is running a simulation of a neural network. So, and when you have that gap, you know, you're, when you're simulating something on hardware that really wasn't meant to be a brain, you take a huge amount of energy and a huge amount of time to, to, to make that work. So what we're building at Rain, we're building neuromorphic hardware. So we're trying to actually make it look, the, the, the fundamentals of the hardware look much, much closer to the brain. And so we do a, a bunch of different kind of wild things in order to do so. We're building analog hardware, we're using nanowires that we develop at Stanford University, um, we're developing algorithms with some really amazing uh, uh, folks at OpenAI. Um, but at the end of the day, we are selling this hardware so we can make neural networks that are today really expensive uh, in the future much cheaper. So we can have you know the best vision and perception in our autonomous vehicles, so we can have you know, in better natural language processing and natural language understanding in any type of platform, whether it's Walmart trying to automatically understand, say, customer commentary and customer complaints um, or automatic captioning of images. You know, there are, you know, we primarily work with, um, we primarily sell to like big data center folks right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day or at, you know, at the end of our development, you know, I really see us as creating markets. Uh, and really, as I see them, they're the markets for robotic brains, you know, for, you know, taking for, there are so many devices, whether it's our cell phones or our cars or, you know, the robots of the future that need to have perception of the world and they need to be able to interact with that world. Mm. And they basically need really efficient hardware to support the neural networks that will give them those capabilities. Wow, that's fascinating. I think, so to sum it up, it sounds like you're helping enable startups that want to build AI type applications. That's exactly right. You're, you're making it much more affordable because I know some of this, I mean, that stuff's available through some of the big providers, but it is not expensive. It is not cheap. No, it is not. Yeah. So, so you're kind of like, I don't know, taking what used to be a supercomputer and now it's right. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. That's great. So, (laughs) It sounds like you, you're you working remote now, obviously remote. Did you start that way? And if you didn't, how did you eventually bring remote in? Yeah, so from the beginning, we've always had a mixture of remote and on-premise work. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been working for three years as a company. Our first year, we were based in Gainesville, Florida, and we had pretty much the whole team um, based in an accelerator uh, incubator office space that we rented there. I believe we did have one intern that was remote. He was um, a student at Wharton Business School at the time for one semester. And so that was our first, my first experience with remote management. Mm-hmm. Um, so since we relocated to California, we've had a number of other remote uh, contractors. So we've done some of our uh, microchip design 
uh, remotely with a team that was based in Florida. We've done other segments of this with contractors based in Ohio and India. Um, so the bulk of our remote uh, work has been primarily through contractors, but all of these have been critical projects, you know, related to our, our, our technology development. Um, and so since, you know, the, the big change, uh, right, with coronavirus and uh, in, in earlier this year, you know, we have had to make a really dramatic transition to almost entirely remote work. Um, and, and, and to give a little more context, we basically have three teams that work uh, uh, in parallel. We have uh, data scientists that develop algorithms and, and that look at new applications of the neural networks. We have what are called CMOS engineers. So that's the silicon uh, uh, that, that forms like the neurons of our neural network and the inputs and outputs. That's, and those two teams can transition to do remote work really easily because it's all just work at a computer. Um, the, our third team, though, is a material science team, and they work in a clean room um, at a facility uh, that we share currently. Um, but the problem and the, the challenge there, that facility has been shut down uh, and has had limited access, and it's very, it's, it's impossible today to do, you know, clean room laboratory experiments in a remote manner. Um, so, you know, this is one that is... Um, you know, we, we'll, we're waiting for access back, but it is an interesting question to, to wonder because I know of other companies that are thinking of like robotic laboratories. And I wonder if the future doesn't hold something like that for us as well, that you know, perhaps there will be ways for, for folks to remotely perform experiments if we can roboticize um, things like clean rooms. But that's a little bit further off. Wow, that's, you don't, and you don't think of this stuff, but yeah, and do you, I mean, like phase two or phase three is starting soon in the, in the you know, easing. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll be included in that, your third team? Um, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely hope so. You know, at the, in the long term, um, you know, we're still a seed stage company uh, as of now. Uh, but in the long term, we're planning to build out our own facilities where we can have our own laboratories and, you know, one of the, the key challenges that we face with this current facility is we share it with other, with other folks, researchers and, and companies. Um, but yeah, definitely hope so because we're kind of itching to get back in the lab. I would imagine. Has it, has it basically shut down production? Or? Um, so those experiments, the, the experiments we perform on our nanowires, we've had to pause. You know, we yeah, haven't yeah. been able to, to make further progress on those. Um, but so we've kind of reallocated that team's efforts to more th things like manufacturing strategy, long-term documentation, you know, more research and planning for new experiments. We've, we've been pretty good about finding things for everyone to, to work on uh, that is still, you know, useful in the long term. Um, but after two and a half months of that, we're kind of, yeah. we, we're, we're ready. <laughs> yeah, this is true. So there's companies like Gaper that help develop, build, and scale products, especially for startups like yourself. You have a, I'm assuming you have very, unique needs in terms of talent yeah so from from that standpoint how important do you think it is to have to have companies like this because when you need something you need it fast you need to be Absolutely. nimble and you and you need to have someone you can trust right no i think it's 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 critically important you know there are we work with so many external partners um you know that you know well we, we handle a huge amount of work ourselves you know that we take on um, but as I said, you know, we've had contractors in multiple locations and, you know, sometimes there are projects where, you know, the, the, the build versus buy decision or, you know, build mm -hmm. internal versus contract decision, it just makes sense to find a trusted external expert who you can delegate that to and who can execute on that in a, in a really timely fashion. So, you know, when we think, when I think of products, you know, that we might use, that we uh, work with other, other teams, you know, it might be you know, proof of concepts with proofs of concept with respect to new algorithms that we're developing, uh, you know, that after we've developed the hardware, you know, there are, you know, application layer layer topics that are, are interesting to explore. Uh, but no, I think companies like Gaper that, you know, provide those services to other startups are really critical because, you know, you can bring your own domain expertise and your own um, understanding and, and, and save companies like us from having to learn everything from the ground up and having to reinvent the wheel ourselves. Yes, very good. So, well, Gordon, I want to thank you for your time today. This has been fascinating. Um, it's a whole world that most people just, it's like, it, it's kind of like, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey was 50 yeah. years ago, right? <laughs>
It definitely is. No, that's honestly, it's funny. My, um, when my parents met each other, they, the first thing they bonded over was a love of science fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was something I was raised on. Uh, and I feel really lucky that, you know, every day I get to work on, you know, these types of sci-fi problems. It's a whole lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I would encourage folks if they want to learn more to check us out at rain.ai uh, to see a little more. All right. Sounds great. Well, thanks again and have a great day. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate it.